We have our amazing lineup here. Look at this. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Big round of applause for all of our presenters this week. Coming. And uh, we are going to start taking questions and answers. So I think we'll just kick it off. If you feel called, please stand up and please speak as loudly as possible so everyone can hear you. And if you are directing it towards a particular person, please say that. Uh, if not, you might get eight answers. So we'll just see how this goes. <laughs> Who would like to start? Okay, Jerry. When I was a kid in Catholic, high school, uh, Catholic grammar school, every time I asked a question about stuff, the nuns would say when they didn't know the answer, take it on faith. <laughs> well, I'm here now, and, and I realized that a lot of the stuff they simply didn't know. <laughs> Indeed, a lot of the priests didn't know. But when I came to the course, I found that little section that talked about ego questions. And that was, for me, the button pusher, take it on faith. So I would like some input about how you react to that, uh, some of the, how Jesus calls some of these questions ego questions, and, and what your feelings are about that. I'll take it. I just say too that at the back of the book, the clarification of terms, which actually was in the first, the front of it, but it got stuck in the back somehow. But I found it back. In the back. It says the ego has many questions that this course has no answers for. You know, how did the separation occur? To whom did the separation occur? And basically, he says, you know, there is no answer, but there is an experience that will come that will end your doubting. So it's almost like he's pointing at just. Do what I'm asking you to do, and follow the instructions in the workbook and practice, and you'll have an experience, and then the questions will disappear. On, on a practical level, over the many years, what I've said is, any kind of question that, that really is about the world, or about the projection, you know, why did this happen to me, and so on and so forth, those are just really statements uh, you could put underneath those questions. I am an ego. They're just declarations of the ego declaring itself. But there are questions when you do start to question your perception, or you start to question your underlying assumptions and your beliefs, they kind of help loosen the attachment and the, the solidity of those beliefs. So those can be helpful. And that's why we have inquiry, and that's why we have contemplation. A lot of very great traditions that help you start to loosen. But in the end, you want to have an experience that undoes all the questions anyway, so that's... Thing. And I do have a question that all always like, confuse me about um, my spirit and soul. If you can just explain them to me, how they work together, how many I know each one of them work together. But so often that I get confused with this clinic and all that, I really appreciate it. And I love you all, and thank you so much for being here for me. Now well, we have to thank Ken Wapnick for his editing job because I think the Urtex had a lot of soul, a lot of soul in it, <laughs> and there were so many connotations throughout many, many traditions about the soul. Is it individualized? Does it mean spirit, and so on and so forth? So that's why I think, basically, um, Ken and Helen and Jesus did a real good job. I think the published version comes back to, he calls it the mind, and then right mind, wrong mind, and so forth. And, you know, in my heart, I just think of the soul is created by God, so soul and spirit are synonymous to me. And then I just work with what Jesus gave me about the split mind, and then what do I need to do to forgive? Is to discern between the right mind and the wrong mind and accept the correction. So I, I just want to thank um, again the elders and the great editing job they did and for giving us such a great published course that's so straightforward and simple that we can practice it. And I wasn't confused at all by the course that I, I worked with it, I studied it, I kept praying and, and asking, but um, I think they did a real good job. So that's, that's all I've got to say. 
it just seems like the, the idea of the soul could be one of many ways where we just go off into countless f fragmentations and, and fracturings. And, and uh, but if we're, remember that we're all just this one spirit, and that's that's kind of nice. Huh? <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, in, in the uh, certainly what David just just said, that spirit and soul, basically, I mean, they are synonymous. Uh, in the introduction to the clarification of terms, Jesus is actually saying, uh, "I'm really not interested in philosophical speculation or precise terminology." He's not interested. He said, that "I'm only interested in atonement." Or correction of perception. Find that on page 77 of the uh, the manual for teachers. Um, actually, there's one other thing I wanted to say, and I completely forgot. So <laughs> I just wanted to uh, add that for most people throughout history, I think the idea of having a soul has been uh, an individual thing. You know, it's like, you know, I have a soul, and I die, and there's this thing that goes on after me. And this thing that goes on after me, well, it looks suspiciously like the body that I just left. And that's still an idea of individuality and personal existence. So it, it's definitely a separation ego idea. And I think, of course, uh, when he uses the word spirit, he's talking about something that is not a partial attribute something that is all of it, something that is perfect oneness with God. So I think that's what, that's what the distinction is with uh, the Course. Spirit would be all of it. And that's why the, uh, the, the published version, anyway, of the Course only uses the word soul when it comes to direct biblical quotations. You know, that's the only time it uses the word. And that's where the editing came in, as David was saying. But spirit would be not a partial attribute, as the Course says. It would be all of it, and that would be the difference. And I think the Course would uh, kind of think is, of the soul as being that seemingly separated mind. It's like you, you seem to be separate from everybody else, and that's really mind. And your mind never stops. Your body appears to stop and die, but your mind keeps right on going. It never stops, and that is what some people would think of as being that soul, that individual soul, which is actually mind. And eventually that mind will be returned to perfect oneness. It's kind of like we took it, now we got to give it back uh, to perfect oneness. Uh, one comes to mind. Uh, I was in Barcelona in, about a year ago, and uh, they wanted to pay me, and they didn't want to send a bank wire, so they gave me cash. And I was, uh, I don't know why I did this, but I put it in my check baggage. And I was told later that you shouldn't do that. <laughs> you should keep it in your carry out. I put it in my uh, check baggage and got to LA and it was all gone. It was, it was all stolen. It was like uh, $13,000. It, it was just gone. And uh, for about five t or ten seconds, it was like, <clears throat> you know? And then, okay, I remembered. And I really think that, that there's a line in the course that applies here. What is a miracle but just remembering? You know, you gotta remember. When the shit hits the fan, you gotta remember. And fortunately for me, I, I remembered pretty quick. 
And when the Course says be vigilant only for God and his kingdom, yes, that's a pretty tall order. But that's what the Course is asking of us, to choose that. And so I chose that, and I realized it was just a dream. And, you know, uh, everything, it doesn't matter whether it's money, possessions, anything in the material world is uh, temporary by definition, including the idea of being here and being in a body, the whole thing is a dream. So I was able to forget it pretty quickly, but only because I remembered. And I find that if you just remember the truth, that's half the battle right there, if you can just remember. So uh, I think that's what the workbook is for and what the training is for, to get you into the habit of thinking with the Holy Spirit so much that when the stuff hits the fan, you will remember. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to share an insight with the Course because, you know, the Course is all about saving time with the miracles. And you know how they tell us when we're growing up too, if you want to be proactive or reactive. I think the story where the upsets come in, you know, it's, it's, we always, it's reactive. We're, we're, that's where the ego is, is in charge. It speaks first and it's in charge. But, you know, I have to say with the Course over the years that one of the subsections that really jumped out to me was the setting the goal section. I felt like I went like 40,000 years ahead with the setting the goal section because I thought, you know, this seems really important because he's saying if you set the goal, if you really set the goal out front, almost like going into a cave and having a torch, if you hold the torch out in front, you will perceive everything and everyone as helping you achieve your goal, whether you call the torch peace, or joy, or happiness, or whatever. So I think I had one of those huge aha moments with that subsection, because I thought, oh, I see. And what is it that prevents you from setting the goal? Some of you also remember rules for decision. You know, the first, the first two are the most important, just like he said, emphasize the, the first two uh, commandments in the Bible, Jesus did, he really emphasized the first two are the most important. And, you know, decide the kind of day you want and say to yourself, if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given me. And then the other ones, he said, it's harder to get back once you've gone off. So I think if you really want to save time, um, you really need to set the goal out front. You really need to be very strong and focused with that, and that's been all these years that I've been on the road, and many miracles, cars disappearing, money disappearing, people disappearing, all <laughs> kinds of things that go on, you know, this is human life, you know, that's what you're going to get, they come, they go, they, whatever, you know, cats disappearing, you know, whatever. But if you set the goal out front, that's so important because that's proactive. That's like saying, Jesus, you're in charge and I'm going to follow you and, and I deserve a happy, joyful life. And also I found that it was only ego goals that get in the way. You know, whether it's expectations around job, family, relationships, whatever, Course in Miracles or your Course in Miracles group, if you have any ego goals, they're coming from the self-concept. So I went through that text and I came back to the self versus self concept sections and I really saw that all roles, all concepts that I was identified with was where the, the fear was coming up and I decided to let go. I decided to follow what Jesus, Buddha was saying, empty the mind of all these concepts. And it comes down to even the Course, if you get frozen into Minister of God or Teacher of God concepts and you have, you have expectations that are around that Teacher of God concept, you better believe they're going to come up because there will be goals tied into those as well and you will not set the goal. You will, you will fall if that happens. So to me that's what this is all about, saving time. And to me that's what has been the greatest thing. My heart leaped when I read that setting the goal section, I said, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, like it's very symphonic, the whole course goes round and round, but if there's something that leaps for you, and something that you can really go with, with all your heart, that will make a huge difference in this whole seeming journey. So I just wanted to share that too. Let's give a big round of applause for all of our